Hey everyone, welcome to another video. Today I'm going to be working on two Nintendo Switches which are purchased off eBay last week and I attempted to fix them in part one of this video and unfortunately I only partially fixed one and I couldn't fix the other at all. So this is going to be a revisit and I'm going to attempt to fully fix one of them and hopefully get somewhere with the second one. So if you haven't watched that video, I'll leave a link in the iCard just above the video. And there'll also be a link in the video description as well. But I highly recommend watching that video first so you can get the full story on what's actually happened with these Nintendo Switches. So the first Nintendo Switch is a water damage Nintendo Switch, which I actually got to turn on, but then it turned out that it needed a Joy-Con rail and a new charger port. So I'm going to try and get this fully fixed today. I have just tried to charge this, and interestingly, I'm not seeing anything on the screen. I don't know if that's because the charger port is damaged, but we'll find out in a minute when I go and take a look into it. So it should technically be working. It was turning on, but I'll figure that out in a minute. And the second one is the blue screen of death one. And I haven't even put this one back together. It's just one of those things. I just don't tend to put my own switches back together until I actually need to, to be honest. But that being said, we're going to take a look at these. We're going to see what we can do about getting these working and we'll see if we can make some money on them so if you are new to the channel i would really appreciate it if you hit subscribe and turn on the bell notifications so that you're notified whenever i release a video and if you want to check me out over on twitch i do stream on twitch as well so if you want to check me out over there there'll be a link in the video description to that and if you're feeling really generous you can even link your amazon prime account and become a twitch subscriber it gives me around about two dollars and fifty per month and it's absolutely free for you guys to do so I really appreciate the support. I genuinely appreciate everyone even just watching the video. So big, big thank you. But that being said, let's get into these repairs. So like I said, we've got these two Nintendo Switches here. This one is the one that had no power. Like I said, I do recommend watching the previous video. But this one had no power. And this was water damaged, which I knew anyway. And I managed to get it working without replacing any chips, but I did have to replace the Joy-Con rails, and one of the Joy-Con rails that I put on was used, and it doesn't appear to work. I don't know if that's the Joy-Con rail causing it, or if it's the board. So I'll find that out in a minute. But the first one I want to look at is the blue screen of Death one. As you can see, it's not even showing up anything on the screen there, which is kind of strange. So I will figure that out, but first I want to look at this blue screen of Death one. So if I plug that in on charge, the battery's dead. But you can see it's got a blue screen of death. And as I explained in the previous video, that is typically down to the CPU. So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be taking the CPU off this and I'm going to attempt to reboil it and hopefully restore those connections and get it working completely. So the blue screen of death is typically caused by a bad connection on the CPU, normally through either drop damage or bend damage, one of the two. And if you take a look at this Nintendo Switch, you can see that it has been significantly bent in the past as well. So I would say it's probably down to bend damage. The problem with these is people put them in the pocket. They're really not designed for that. They might be designed as portable, but they're designed to be in your hand. It's a handheld console. It's not designed to be in your pocket. So let's take a look. So what I'm going to do first of all is, like I said, I'm going to remove the CPU. It's a BGA chip, which means it's got solder balls underneath and the solder balls have to make a connection with the motherboard and basically if i just grab a example board here this is one i've pulled the cpu off before and as you can see there's a bga there a ball grid array it's basically a big array of solder balls and they make a contact with the chip and that allows the chip to communicate with the rest of the board so when you get a blue screen of death it's because some of the solder balls on the chip are not making a contact with the pads on the board and sometimes and most of the time in fact you end up with torn traces down the bottom here so i'm kind of expecting some torn traces down the bottom or a couple in this top left corner that's typically what happens hopefully that's not the case hopefully it's a case of just taking the cpu off reboarding it and then jobs are good on. but i'm kind of expecting it to have some torn traces to be honest with you so what i'll do then is First of all, I'm going to put it into a board holder so as I can keep the board nice and still. And then I'll remove the CPU with hot air. It can be done with hot air. It's a small chip. But I'll remove the CPU and then I'll get the CPU onto my CPU holder slash jig. And I'll use the stencil 
with some solder paste to reboil it. All right, and I'm going to just grab my hot air. I'm going to set my hot air at 420 degrees Celsius at 40% airflow. And I'm just going to add some flux around the edge of the chip. And I'm going to preheat the board first. So I'm going to come in at a distance and preheat the board. And then I'm going to come in a bit closer and lift this chip off. Okay, the CPU is loose. Just remove that. And there we go. All right, so I'm just gonna give it a close inspection. And yeah, we do have a torn trace on the edge there. So there's one lifted trace there. I'm not going to see the true extent of the damage until it comes to actually removing the solder off the BGA. And that was a really clean lift, actually. But this would explain why the reflow didn't work. So typically a reflow will work, but not when you have torn traces. Because obviously if you've got a torn trace then there's no physical way to get that contact back without running a jumper wire. So it's looking like just one torn trace, just down in this bottom corner. So I kind of expected it on the bottom rows. So usually the torn traces are down the bottom on the bottom rows and this top corner here. I've never seen any torn traces anywhere else apart from there. So what I need to do then, before I go any further, is just clean up the solder that's on these pads. And the way I'm going to do that is by adding some leaded solder first. That's going to reduce the melting temperature of the solder that's on the pads. So I'll add some leaded solder first and then I'll wick it all away using solder braid. And it should give me a nice clean area to work with. So for this I'm going to be using Kester leaded solder. This is I believe 6337 and I get this imported from the US. So you can't actually buy it in the UK unfortunately. I'm just going to put a blob of solder onto my soldering iron. I'm just going to go around in a circle. Alright, so I've replaced the solder. So now I should be able to wick it away. So I'm going to take some solder braid. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a little bit of hot air to assist me as well. And the reason for that is because these traces are fragile on their own. Without putting any excess pressure on them. So what I want to do is I want to use some hot air along with the soldering iron. And what that's going to do is it's going to reduce the amount of heat that I need to put on with the soldering iron itself. And it's also going to reduce the risk of damage to the pads by the soldering iron. So what I'll do then is I'll clean up once more using some more isopropyl alcohol. And then what I'll do is I'll inspect it again and just go around wherever I feel like there might be too much solder left on the pad. I am also going to need to go around and just make sure that the solder pads are all good. And that we've got no more missing. And if there's any, one, any solder pads that are oxidised, I need to sort them out as well. Okay, so I actually think that the rest of those pads are absolutely fine. I don't think there's going to be anything wrong with them. So, the only one we really need to do is going to be this one here. So we need to run a jumper wire for this, but that's pretty much it. So what I need to do then, first of all, is just expose some of this trace.
I'm going to scrape it with my knife. Just like that. And then if I clean that away, I'll have some nice freshly exposed copper to be able to solder to. So basically a solder pad is just a little bit of copper, a little bit of tinned copper. And what we need to do is we need to recreate that. And the way we do that is with what's called a bit of jumper wire or link wire. However you want to pronounce it. Well, basically what we do is we just find the nearest point to solder to on that particular line. And then we can just basically run a wire. So we solder a wire to that point on the line run it down to where it's meant to go to and basically just recreate the pad that was meant to be there. So it's a little bit of a tedious task, but it's not impossible. It's a little bit more difficult when it's this small. Now you bear in mind that the solder balls on a Nintendo Switch CPU are around about 0.35 millimeters. Yes, I said millimeters. So 0.35mm is <laughs> definitely not to be laughed at. It's small. It's real small. And working on that kind of scale does require a lot of concentration and a lot of patience. So what I want to do is just tin the wire. Or rather tin the trace. Like that. And then I'm going to have to get some jumper wire. So the jumper wire I have is literally the width of a human hair. It's 0 0.067 millimetres, which is literally the width of a human hair. So it's extremely thin, it's extremely fragile, and it's extremely tricky to work with. But it's absolutely necessary if I want to successfully run this jumper wire. So this is enamelled wire, so what I need to do first is just expose the inner core by scraping it a little with the iron and then I need to try and solder it to this very very thin trace which again like I said is no easy task even just getting it to make a contact sometimes you can get lucky and get it to hit first time Sometimes you can be there forever. And it doesn't help that I've broken my micro pencil, so I don't actually have one at the minute. So I don't have a soldering iron tip small enough to work with this kind of scale at this very moment. Could have probably picked a better time. But when that's tacked down, I can hold it in place with tweezers. And then try and get it to bond. I'm just trying to expose a little bit more there. Okay, I think I've got that. So I'm going to trim that and then I'm going to clean up so I can see what I'm doing. It doesn't really matter where I trim it right now. There you go. And then I'm going to just clean up, get rid of that flux that's there the burnt flux and then i need to position the wire properly and then secure it down properly as well so i'll just warm it up with a little bit of warm air there so nothing's worse than trying to clean off the burnt flux Alright, I think that should be clean enough there. So now what I need to do is just make sure that it's in position and then I'm going to need to shape it in the form of a new pad. Alright, I don't... I'm not quite keen on that with how it's soldered. I'm not quite keen on how that's soldered. 
to be honest. It's not quite bonded how I would like. Oh, you would not believe that that was the smallest amount of flux I could get off the tube with the tweezers. I think that might be better. So now I'm just going to trim the edge a little bit. And then I'm going to try and curl this round. Okay. Uh, what that's going to do is it's going to allow for the solder to bond somewhere. So what I need to do now is just secure them in place. And to do that, I'm going to need to use some conformal coating, also known as solder mask. So I've just got a bit on the edge of my tweezers. Um, uh, maybe not because there's pears all over it, so I'm going to have to clean that. So I'll just pop some coating over there. And then I'm going to cure that using some UV light for about 30 seconds. And then it should be good to go. Okay. Good. And next what I want to do is just basically clean off the CPU. And then I can reboard it, or hopefully reboard it, and then I can get it back onto the board. So I'm going to just do the same with this. I'm going to replace the solder with leaded solder before I wick it away. All right. So let's just wick this away then. Okay, and I'll get some fresh wick. And the reason I'm not using hot air this time is quite simple. The chip on its own hasn't got a very high thermal mass, which means that it doesn't take much to wick the solder away. So I don't need any assistance from hot air. Okay, so I'm going to give this a clean and then again I'll wick it once more using some fresh flux. And a final clean. And then I need to inspect the pads, make sure that they're all good. If there's any darker pads, I need to give them a little scrape to make sure that we're going to get solder to bond to them when I do eventually get around to that part. So if we've got any darker pads, i.e. oxidisation, then I'll need to take care of that before I reboard it because otherwise the solder's not going to bond. And if it does bond, it's not going to bond very well. And within days or weeks, we'll probably have a blue, blue screen of death again. So I need to make sure that all of the pads are good before I do that. Before I actually get to the reboarding process. And it should be nice and shiny. Okay, so I'm not going to get the entire chip in the microscope's view, unfortunately. It's a little bit too big. 
but I'll do my best. So I'm just going to spread some solder paste all the way across. Making sure that I fill every single gap. The good thing about this stencil is it does hold everything in place for you. The magnet is super strong. I think you just run across as many times as you want with the solder paste. And it should be staying in position. I'm just going to make sure I get it in the corners because they're usually the most difficult. Alright. Let's give that a whirl, shall we? So, as you can see, I've tried to fill the gaps as much as I can, as much as it'll actually allow me. So what I need to do now is I need to knock my airflow right the way down. I'm going to knock it down to 10%, and I'm going to go for 340 degrees Celsius. And the reason for that is because the trick to reboiling is taking it slow. And I mean real slow. So you don't want to take it too quickly and you also don't want to put too much too much airflow through at the same time. So I'm going to come in from a distance to start with. And you'll see the flux will start to melt. So there's flux already in the solder paste. The solder paste is basically just millions and millions of tiny, tiny, tiny balls. And then it's mixed with flux. Which is why you can see odd little glistens as some of the odd solder balls are starting to melt. I'm just taking it slow. Now I'm going to move in and start focusing on individual areas. I could probably do with increasing temperature a little bit, so I'm going to go an extra 20 degrees. And go to 360. This is lead free solder as well, so it does take a bit more to warm up and to actually melt. Here we go. Alright, I'm going to let that settle for a second. I'm going to go to 380 at 20% and I'm going to flow them once more. Making sure that I get in the corners as well. And then let it cool again. Absolutely beautiful. I think that went well. I'm going to slide off the plate. It's a little bit hot at the minute. I'm going to slide off the plate and then I'm going to try and extract the chip. I may have lost a couple of capacitors there. I'll check that out in a minute. That could have happened with the reflow as well. That looks good to me. Let's clean it off. So I'll need to inspect another CPU just to see if those capacitors are meant to be missing or not. I've probably knocked a couple. But to be fair, it's not the that's not going to be the end of the world. 
I can put them back. It probably will stop it turning on, but I can put them back. It shouldn't be an issue. Okay, here we go. Add some flux. And then I'm just going to drop the chip back on. And get it in position. And then all I've got to do is flow it down. And then I think I've probably got to replace some capacitors as well. Okay, so I'm going to go back to 420 at 40% 40 airflow. And just flow this down. Alright, I'm going to add some more flux all the way around once it's cooled down a little bit. Okay, so I've got flux everywhere now. Alright, that's flowed down, I think. Okay, and now that that's cooled down a little bit, I'm going to start to put it back together. And let's just hope it works. Because if you don't, I'm probably going to cry or something, to be honest. I think the V-ball went fine. I think the V-ball went okay. But other than that, I don't know. We'll be able to find out. Ah, uh, that's... It's not working. Yeah, we're getting 5 volts at 0 amps. Oh, 0.31. Fifteen volts, no point thirty one amps. No, I don't think it's gonna work. Oh, that sucks. Okay, well, that's unfortunate. I think this board is a donor board. And no backlight as well. Which sucks even more. So, yeah, I think I've probably killed it, to be honest. Well, I can refurb the case. I can put a new digitizer on the case, refurb that, and then put another board in it when I get one. That's not... You know, it's not the end of the world, I suppose. But, unfortunately, the blue screen of death one is going to be unfixable. Or at least, for me, it's going to be unfixable. Which kind of sucks, but... It is what it is. I think the V-ball went okay. And, uh, yeah, it's just one of them things, I suppose. So, yeah, we've got no life out of that at all now. So, it probably was because of the damaged um, trace. Um, I don't think the V-ball went terrible. Never mind. Nothing we can do. So, yeah, that's going to be it for that one, unfortunately. But we do still have this one to work on. Which is good, I suppose. So, this one is in really good condition. But, unfortunately... Oh, there you go. It's actually showing up a charging symbol now. Weird. So, this one needs a new charge port. And also a Joy-Con rail. I'm going to let this charge... Um, actually, it seems to be charging with this new charger I've got. Which is kind of weird. So, it might not actually need a charge port. It could just be that I've got a faulty charger. But... I do know that there's a Joy-Con rail which needs replacing at least. So I'm going to let this charge up, give it a test, show you that it's the same console. And then I'll get the thing fixed. Okay, this is charged enough to turn on. So let's just take a look. And as you can see, it's all the same uh, 
same switch, all the same accounts on it and everything. Now, I did speak to the seller, and the seller said that they was going to get the parental controls removed. So, basically, I need to just log into the internet and see if they've removed it. I'm just enter my Wi-Fi password. Don't worry, that password's not used for anything else. Connect to the internet. Reflections are awkward. So, technically, in a little while, oh, 2181-4007, what's that? Huh, I've never seen that ever code before. Oh, and then it's just died on me again. <laughs> All right, well, I need to open it up anyway, so I'm going to, while I'm waiting for that to actually charge again now, I'm going to just open it up, just so as I can start to think about replacing that. Joy-Con rail again with another one. I'm going to take the Joy-Con rail off here actually. Might as well make use of the parts. Uh, that's turned back on. So when it turns on, I do technically have to unplug it and plug it back in because the charger source that I've got, whenever it turns back on, for some reason, it just flickers on and off. But it does work, it charges, but then it just flickers on and off when it first turns on. It's very strange. The reason I use that one is because it's up, it supports up to 20 volts, 65 watts. So it supports most MacBooks as well, which is the main reason I've got it. All right, so let's just have a look at what's going on then. Hmm. So when I try and go to the parental controls it comes up 2187-0007 so I need to try and find a way to factory reset this I think technically if the person's removed it then realistically it should just log out let's see if there's anything I can do So let's run a system update. So I'm going to run through this system update and uh, I'll see what happens. Okay, it does say that there's an update available. So I'll let that update. I think the parental controls have been removed. Maybe it's just having a problem updating the actual firmware to rectify it. So I'm going to let this update while I'm just opening the rest of it up. And actually, I'm going to grab some Joy-Cons. I need to figure out, well, I need to remember which ones are actually faulty. So, I know there's only one Joy-Con rail faulty. I can't remember which one it is. Right, it's going to be the left one then. Oh, maybe not. Oh, wait, what? What the? <laughs> All right then, fine. Um, that's weird. It wasn't working on one of them Joy-Con rails the other day. It's genuinely the same switch. It's genuinely, genuinely the same switch. See if that wants to focus. 4004534 It is the same switch. That's weird because I haven't touched this since the other day. Well, it's going to be a bonus if I don't have to replace anything because I think it's my charger what was faulty on the other one if you noticed I've changed chargers 
if you remember the old charger i've still got the old charger it's a blue one but i've changed chargers because i've been having a couple of issues with it but that appears to be working for the joy-con rail so i've literally just got to get the parental control sorted and then i can resell this switch and i'm gonna make I'd, I'd say i'll probably make my money back for both switches but i don't think i'll be in profit but i will have parts from the other one so that's a good a good thing i suppose so i'm just gonna open this up and then you'll see it's the same switch actually because you'll probably recognize it i don't want people thinking that i've switched the switch or something <laughs> pun intended well, I don't think anyone's thinking that I've switched the boards because I genuinely haven't. I can show you the serial number in a minute through the software itself. And I haven't touched it since I did the video. So it is really odd. Uh, anything identifiable? Maybe that cap there. On BQ. There you go. Yeah, so, I mean, it's really weird because everything seems to be working on it now. In terms of serial numbers, four double zero four five three four one two one eight. It's the same serial number. If you go back on the other video, you'll see that. There we go. Look, it's just been unlinked after the update. Nice, nice. So the reason that's happened is because I did message the seller and yeah, they've uh, obviously unlinked it. So now I should be able to just go to the formatting options and restore factory settings. And there you go. We've got a fully working switch. Oh, that's fantastic. So we've got one fully working switch. The other one, we've got parts from it. Nothing, you know, there's nothing we can do about that. I mean, obviously the reball didn't go to plan. It seemed to go okay. The actual reball seemed to go okay, but we've got the housing, we've got the game card reader and things like that. I mean, the mid frame, no good, not really. But everything else on it is fine, and I'll probably use it as my new test housing, to be honest. Right, okay, that is back together. So, yeah, this is in absolutely great condition and it should be a really easy sale to be honest it's in good condition it's potentially exploitable it's got a screen protector on it so the screen underneath is going to be i assume going to be mint and yeah overall i'm happy with it it's not a bad price for a fully working switch in really good condition so this has just got a factory reset i'm assuming it's going to work absolutely fine so it saves three minutes but uh yeah it never takes that long it always takes long it always takes longer than that right so there we have it so this is back together and just finishing up on the factory reset uh it's kind of weird so i think the charger that i had was probably faulty i mean i've had it a while it's seen some use and i've still got it but it has seen some use so i might just use it on something else that doesn't need unplugging but basically this one appears to be working absolutely fine. I did, like I said, get in touch with the seller and they've kindly removed the Nintendo account. So they've unlinked it from their account online. And that's removed the parental controls pin. It does it automatically when you remove the account. So as soon as I signed into the internet and updated the software, it was ready to go. And this is obviously, as you can see, back to resetting right now, which means that once it's done, I can resell this as a tablet only. It's a shame about the other one. Uh, I mean, to be fair, when you look at the bend damage on that, it's pretty rough. So what I'll likely do with this is I'll scrap the middle housing, the mid-frame, 
and I'll take the digitizer off this. I'll put take the LCD out. Probably won't reuse the digitizer because once you take them off, it's not really wise to reuse them. But I've got brand new digitizers, so what I'll likely do is just take the LCD from this, use that on another repair, and or either that or I'll put it with a new mid frame. I've got loads of mid frames that I can use, as well as the fact that I've got the fan, the battery, the game card reader the Joy-Con rails and things like that. So, yeah, I've got a complete housing unit which I just need to replace the mid-frame, really. Um, like I said, probably won't use the digitizer again. But, yeah, it is what it is, I suppose. But, unfortunately, I couldn't fix number two. But we have got number one fully working and I'm able to resell it. So, that's going to be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. I really do appreciate it. If you do have any comments or questions, let me know down in the comment section down below. I read pretty much every comment. If I see it, I'm reading it. So if I get a little notification, then I'll read it. And I'll go through my comments daily as well. So if you do have any comments or questions, by all means, leave them down in the comment section down below. I'll do my best to answer. And if you need to organise your own repair, you can do so getting in touch using the website address in the video description. Just head over to the website, use the booking page, or you can view the prices. Or there's a contact us page as well where you can get in touch with me to get a custom quote if you need one or to ask any questions that you might have. If you enjoy this type of content and you want to see more, be sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on bell notifications. That way you're notified whenever I release a video. And if you want to support me, then you can do so by using the Patreon link in the video description. You can use the join button down below the video to become a channel member. Or you can head over to Twitch and you can subscribe through Twitch Prime. And if you link your Amazon account to Twitch Prime, then you do it for free, but it does give me $2.50 every month. It all helps out the channel, helps me to keep making content like this. It allows me to actually be able to afford to buy stuff that I might not be able to fix, that I might lose money on. But that's going to be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Until next time, I'll see you later. Bye for now.